Hello and welcome to Lady Parts. I'm your host, Sarah Hyland. Today we empower you to be the best advocate for your lady parts and make sure you're heard by your doctor. It's Lady Parts, at your cervix. I'm joined by our Lady Parts OBGYN, Dr. Sherry, and her colleague, RN Danny Tatum. And this week's guests, actress, model, radio, and television personality, Eva Marcel, and co-host of Armchair Expert, Monica Padman. Hi guys, I'm so excited that you all are here. Monica, <laughs> Eva, Danny, thank you so much. Are you guys ready to talk about female healthcare? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yes, we are. Here we are in 2020, and there are at least 26 FDA approved drugs for erectile dysfunction, yet only two FDA approved drugs for women who experience problems with sexual arousal. Why do you think that is? Patriarchy. Next. Why they have so many more medicines than us, I have no clue. Viagra was, was approved by the FDA in 1998, and a woman's yep. drug wasn't approved until 2015. What do you think that says about male arousal versus female arousal? A lot of people think that the penis is the power, but when in actuality, the vagina has all the power. I would prefer for us to have equal power. I don't think one is more superior than the other, right? So I think men are as important as women, but the question is why does society think that men are more important? Because we, I mean, it's a man's world, like James Brown said, but but it don't mean a thing if it ain't got a woman. Yep. So Thank it's you. Great. men are great, <laughs> but we deserve equal. We don't want more, we just want the same. Thank you for quoting James Brown, Eva. <laughs> I think there's this perception kind of societally that if the man is having a problem, it's medical. And if the woman is having a problem, it's mental. Like it's something that they should get over on their own or, you know, it's just like they need to get over it as opposed to um, men where it's like a very physical, I mean, erections are so physical that you could just like point to it and be like, well, that's medical and what they're going through is not, which is not true. Good point. Dr. Sherry, is a woman's libido purely dependent on her mental state or can it also be a medical condition? Yeah, I, I mean, 100%. We are much more emotionally connected uh, under the covers than, than men. And if you think about it, historically, culturally, religiously, sex, right, has been for men. So there is complete, you know, sort of social inequity going on. This is part of the problem. I'm a mother of three. And when I learned my libido drop is usually around postpartum time for me. You know, there's something about how you feel about yourself that allows you to be comfortable or even aroused. So postpartum has, uh, I definitely saw a lot of decreased libido around having a baby and right after and then took the steps to kind of get myself back in order to find that arousal again. But I agree with Dr. Sherry, it's up here, not down here. So if, if your partner's like, hey baby, you feeling something? Who talks like that? Why am I saying it like, <laughs> hey, like, who am I, Elvis? <laughs> Eva, have you ever come up with an excuse when you're not in the mood? Sometimes I'm in the mood and he's completely not, and then I'm in a really good sleep and then he wants to wake me up. So I just, my aunt Flo, I say is- Wakes you up? Middle of the night? So this is what <laughs> the new rule is. Wow. If you wake me up with proper foreplay, then you can wake me up. Okay, that's oh, bad. There you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> nice. I like that. If it's proper foreplay, it's okay. Go Eva, go. So he's in the subway and I'm up top, and yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> there is a um, major issue in healthcare, and one of the biggest issues, in my opinion, is racial bias. Black women are 62% more likely to die from cervical cancer, 39% more likely to die from breast cancer, and 50% more likely to have preterm birth than white women. 
What questions can a woman of color ask at the doctor's office to make sure they are being heard? When women of color go in to see their doctors, first of all, you know, they're n nervous anyway. You're going into the doctor's office. You need to ask questions, overall health questions when you go in. Is my weight appropriate for my height and my age? Is, you know, because you want to be, you want to prevent things from happening. Um, are there any tests that I should be taking early to make sure that nothing comes up later? What the frustrating thing is as a black woman in America is to know that there are so many inequities when it comes to health care. Because I'm just a, at the end of the day, I'm a person who happens to be a woman who happens to be black, right? But when I get pregnant, the likelihood of me going into preterm labor, which I did with my last son at 30 weeks, and so every single oh week God, I was wow. in the hospital wow. afraid of having this child early. And it took me having a black PCP. It took me having a black OBGYN, shout out to Dr. Jackie, to explain to me the importance of keeping, and let me be clear, my first doctor, my Middle Eastern doctor in Los Angeles, I only trust my life with black and Middle Eastern doctors because they know my genetic predispositions as a black woman. So if I have a daughter um, preterm or premature, the likelihood of her faring properly, if I have a son early, if his lungs will develop properly and the comparison to white babies or Asian babies, male or female. And if you don't have a doctor that prioritizes someone that looks like you, then you fall in the gap and you find yourself, you know, hurt in the end. And it's super sad that I shouldn't have to find a black doctor. I just want a doctor. You don't need to be black or white. Yeah. You should know the issues that pertain to Asian women or Latina women so you can help them properly. To all of your patients. Yeah. Going to the doctor can be scary, but here's a little something to help you loosen up before your next appointment. Hey, you. Yeah, you, sitting in the waiting room. You got here right on time for your appointment, prompt and beautiful. And that means I have roughly 30 minutes to get this out before the nurse calls your name. Heads up, it's gonna be cold in there. And it's okay if you didn't get a wax, they don't care about that. And yes, you are going to wanna lie about how many glasses of alcohol you drink a week, but don't do it. They're not here to judge you. Here's what you need to remember when you're in there. Take out that list of things you wanted to discuss. Be prepared and make them listen. If your doctor thinks it's just stress, list your other symptoms. Explain why this is different. You know what stress feels like. Nervous about something your doctor said? Ask a follow-up question, take notes. Follow up when you get home and ask for the best way to get in touch. Oh, and your gown goes the other way. It's confusing, don't worry about it. I know, I've made the mistake plenty of times. Black women are more likely to die from cervical cancer. What annual tests should women of color be doing to protect themselves against cervical cancer? Pap smears save lives by preventing or acknowledging if you have cervical cancer. Your first pap smear doesn't have to start until 21, and that's just a regular pap smear only. Between 21 and 29, you're gonna get a pap smear every three years. But between 30 and 65, you're gonna get a pap plus HPV screening. And HPV, it's called co-testing, is really important because as Danny mentioned, Dr. Danny, I like to call her, <laughs> is that if you have HPV, you could be at risk for cervical cancer. So it's actually a co-test done between 30 and 65. Um, and if you have it, it's gonna increase your risk of cervical cancer and that's something that we as doctors wanna know. Now if you're over 65 and if you've had normal pap smears or never had a problem with you know, precancer cells, then you may never need a pap smear again. So you, you, you have to ask the questions with your doctor. Um, you have to really be you know, uh, your best advocate. Monica, have you experienced anything with that? What is your experience going to a doctor? Do you feel like you are listened to and that you're heard? I think it's both, right? Like there's the genetic component where they just 
yeah, people who, who share your genetics might have an understanding that some other people don't, even though that should not be the case. It should all be just one. But also there's just intrinsic bias, right? Like that you can't get over where I know there's all these studies about women of color who will go in and request pain medication because they're in pain and they are less likely to be given it than a white person because there's all this bias about like, oh, well, they might be lying or they might use it to sell or, you know, all of these things that are injustices yeah. that ha you know, that happen on these small levels that lead to these cycles. And so I've definitely felt that going into the doctor's office. But for me, I have felt it a little more as a female, I think almost more than a person of color. I had a seizure a, t a couple years ago and I didn't know it was in my sleep. And I oh woke gosh. up and I felt crazy and my back hurt and I, it was this like kind of crazy thing. And I went to the doctor and it was a white male doctor. And I was like, so I had this, I, I don't know what it was, but I know something happened. Like my body does not react like this. And he was like, okay, we'll do a urine test and oh, it's fine. And we'll just give you a steroid shot. Like it's fine. And I was like, it's not fine. Like I know my body, something is not right. Let's, you know, can we investigate this a little more? But they're just so willing to not take you as seriously. And I put that in the category as being a female, but I'm sure being a person of color had an impact too. Otherwise oh like, my God. could have never found it, never known. I have been in and out of the hospitals since I was born. And as a female, I have noticed that doctors tend to not listen to women. Sorry, except for Danny and Dr. Sherry um, and, and my current <laughs> doctors now, but they don't take women's um, side effects or things that they are experiencing to heart. Everyone thinks that women have like the highest pain threshold. And you know what? I do, I got a really high pain threshold. But if I say that I am experiencing a 10 pain, that's when you should be like, oh, what the f is she going through right now? It took right. me years and years and years to get diagnosed with endometriosis, purely because doctors are like, meh, you got bad cramps. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Stop being dramatic. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, there's a lot of choices of doctors out there and there are good doctors. There are good doctors that, that, that treat everyone equally because you have to be your best advocate. How do you know if you're like a hypochondriac or if you're actually listening to your body? How do you know the difference? You know, you need to take uh, good notes about your symptoms and you need to be able to com you know, communicate them with your doctor if it's tied to your menstrual cycle, if you're having painful intercourse, you know, you keep track. And then when you go into the doctor, you come in with like, this is what's happening to me. This is not my normal. Monica, if you could give um, advice to a young woman going to the doctor for the first time, what would you tell her? This is tricky for me because I've also been called a hypochondriac. I was gonna ask Dr. Sherry, do women tend to get called that more than men? I assume yes. Culturally, we are more emotional. Right, we're more emotional yeah. on every level. So, and men are, are meant to be more stoic and you know, they don't even go to the doctor. Like we go to the gynecologist Thank once you. a year exactly. for our breast exam. That's what I was gonna say. Men won't even go to the doctor. Like even if they need to go to the doctor, we're not hypochondriacs, we're actually just responsible. Yeah. I guess I would say um, to, to a young woman to make sure you're getting your routine checks. So like I've been going once a year to get like full blood work and it just, for me that like calms me in general. It's just like, oh, I know like my blood work was good. So if I'm feeling a little funky, you know, you can kind of take your own temperature of how you feel. You know, I think you just have to know your body and trust your body. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. It was amazing to have you on the show and I loved talking about all of these things with injustices for not only uh, women of color, but for anyone who identifies as a woman. Um, so thank you so much for being here. It was so awesome to meet you guys. Thank you so much, Danny and Dr. Sherry. Bye, ladies. Bye.